Sea Curses are one of the few things that make Arcane Odyssey more of a magic game than a pirate adventuring game in my eyes. Sea Curses are pretty self-explanatory. By their name alone, they're curses you find in the sea. Heavily inspired by Devil Fruit from One Piece, Sea Curses are practically the end game of magic in the Arcane universe. Thus far, I've touched on Sea Curses a little bit, but considering they're extremely important in the plot, I think they deserve their own video, and 90% of you guys also seem to think so. I'm going to summarize real quick how Sea Curses came into existence. For those of you that don't want to hear all that, you can cut to the time shown on the screen or, you know, you can watch my full lore summary so I don't have to waste your time. Anyways. Arcane Odyssey is rooted in Greek mythology, but instead of Prometheus giving humanity fire, instead he gave mankind magic. Mankind went berserk and desperately fought for precious resources to increase their power. The strongest of these wizards, known as Arthur Cursebeard, knocked on Prometheus' front door and said, Hey man, you're gonna make sea curses, whether you like it or not. Cursebeard then proceeded to beat the snot out of Prometheus, and in Prometheus' final breath, he made sea curses. Sea curses, after Prometheus created them, appeared across the arcane world as large cubes of pure magic and energy emanating from them. Each sea curse is different from each other, but they all share the same power of making the wielder immortal by binding their form with magic so that they are one. The wielder of the sea curse only being able to be killed under special circumstances, and upon death, the sea curse is ejected from their body and will land somewhere random in the world. There's basically three different types of sea curses. Elemental sea curses, external sea curses, and the super curses. Sounds like a lot, but it's really not. Elemental sea curses are the sea curses that apply to the elements, such as ash, glass, or magma, even allowing the wielder of these sea curses to transform into their element. Basically, if the curse focuses on a magic that a player can wield in Arcane Odyssey, it's an elemental sea curse. These are different from external sea curses. While the elemental sea curses focus primarily on the elements of the arcane world, external sea curses are more for utility. Easily the greatest example of this is the absorption curse. The absorption curse allows the curse user to steal magic and curses from other individuals. Another good example is the Lazarus curse, allowing the user to revive themselves, doubling their strength but decreasing the chance they would get revived in the future. You can pretty much identify these curses because they don't directly associate themselves with a specific element. And lastly, the super curses. There's only one person known to have ever wielded a super curse, and that's Arthur Cursebeard. Super curses are extremely rare in the arcane world. Basically, they only appear when two different curses fuse together into one powerful curse by colliding at high velocities. Either that or the wielder can absorb both curses at the same time. Due to this absorption part of obtaining a super curse, you can argue that Durza could have had access to a super curse due to having the absorption curse and being able to steal magic, but it's never been outright stated that Durza has a super curse. Oh, also, side note, I just wanted to say that Cursebeard forced Prometheus to make sea curses and then killed him allied himself with Poseidon and convinced Poseidon to join his pirate crew, led one of the most powerful pirate fleets in the arcane lore, is the only confirmed wielder of a super curse, confronted the AG and pretty much walked away from it back to his massive castle, held multiple curses including one gifted to him by Poseidon, fiercely respected by Theos to the point where Theos wanted to ask Cursebeard for help, and killed undead Poseidon, meaning that he had killed multiple gods by the end of his lifetime. Anyways, enough de-writing, that's pretty much all there is for sea curses. See you guys next time. Oh yeah, that. So with everything else in the Arcane story, not everything is cut and dry. As I mentioned before, there are three main types of sea curses, elemental, external, and the super curses. However, there are also specialty curses that exist. Honestly, in my opinion, some of these specialty curses should just be included in one of the three main types, but they deserve their own portion in this video due to how important some of them are. The biggest example of these specialty curses are the Grand Fire Curses. Now you might be saying, wait, fire curses? Wouldn't that just be elemental due to it being in relation to fire? Yes and no. Yes, these Grand Fire Curses all do relate to fire in some way, but each one has its own specialty trait that makes it different from the fire curse. Which is where things get muddy. In my eyes, I would consider these curses as elemental curses. But I know a lot of others are probably gearing up to drop a textbook of non-canon lore on me, so we'll compromise. The Grand Fire Curses were created by Prometheus, go figure, as a backup plan to Arthur Cursebeard. See, Prometheus really couldn't refuse Arthur Cursebeard's request due to how powerful he was, so when Prometheus created the Sea Curses, he created five Grand Fire Curses and shot them into space, and then scattered the rest of the curses across the arcane world. Prometheus created these Grand Fire Curses to be especially powerful so that anyone who collected one would immediately have the power to take down Cursebeard, shooting them into space so that they would never be picked up by some random doofus until they fell back down into the seven seas or wherever. 
That takes us into each of the Grand Fire Curses. The Ethereal Fire Curse, arguably the weakest of its siblings, being bright yellow and its special trait being that it emits blinding lights and flashes from its flames. The Scorch Fire Curse being an extremely explosive type of green flame, the Dark Flame Fire Curse, Basically tied for the second strongest fire curse, it's predominantly black and purple and has a special trait of basically consuming everything in its vicinity, not only spreading extremely fast, but having the additional trait of becoming more powerful the users in combat for. The Inferno Fire Curse I said the Dark Flame was tied for second strongest Grand Fire Curse because of the Inferno Curse. The Inferno Curse takes the appearance of large blue flames, easily the hottest and most intense types of flames, being able to burn through and incinerate literally anything. However, this brings me to the strongest of the Grand Fire Curses, and in my opinion, the strongest curse, the Promethean Flame Curse. The Promethean Flame Curse takes its place as white colored flames. Its special attribute? It literally has all of the attributes of all the other Grand Fire Curses, but turned down a little bit. Is it as hot as the Inferno Curse? No, but it's still much hotter than every other Fire Curse. Is it as dangerous and fast spreading as the Dark Flame Fire Curse? No, but it's faster spreading and more dangerous than every other fire curse, so on and so forth, basically packing all of the abilities of these other curses into one. In fact, there's actually a weapon named the Sword of Morok's Fire, imbued with a Promethean Flame, and I think it speaks for itself. <laughs> In addition to the Grand Fire Curses, there's other curses that are outliers from this main formula, but honestly, they're so minor and non-existent that talking about them, in my opinion, is pretty pointless. Feel free to socialize and talk about sea curses in the comments below, and subscribe if you want to hear me talk about Roblox. Later. play like that you better have shockwaves to finish the job because if that guy had shockwaves after he railed me like that from behind wait a minute